I'm on? Okay, thank you. All right. Today is Mother's Day, and we got a lot of mothers up here. And let's, all these babies, let's thank the Lord for them. Amen. And dads. <laughs> We're so, so grateful for each of you today, and we want to enter, we're going to dedicate these parents and these children to the Lord, and I want to tell you who they are up here, okay? How are y'all doing? Hello, how are y'all? First of all, Wade Franklin Apperson and Wyatt Farmer Apperson, and their parents, Will and Lauren. I'm sorry, I, I, did, I got in front of the camera. Okay, there you go. All right, good. Catherine Rivers Brunt and David and Brittany are the parents. My daughters say the bigger the bow, the better the mom. All right, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Elijah Lynn Carden and the parents are Joey and Melinda. Mary Allen Castellaw, and the parents are Michael and Mandy. Who are you? Sykes Hamilton Day, and the parents are Dylan and Ashley. That's great. Dean Bentley Gooden, and the parents are Caleb and Lauren. We let Dean listen to one of my sermons right before he came out. <laughs> Put him to sleep. Okay. okay. Hannah Grace Jones and the parents are Caleb and Lacey. So pretty. Campbell David Coke and the parents are Tyler and Catherine. Andy Morgan Kaiser, and the parents are Andrew and Shelby. Kay Riona, White Their Arrow Minor, and the parents are Rufus Neal and Jane Boa. Gavin Michael Norid. And Rhett, Andrew, Norid, and the parents are Greg and Katie. How y'all doing? Ellie, Jane, Now, and Zeke, <laughs> Zeke, Reinhardt, Now, and the parents are Matthew and Cynthia. Raven, Grace. Palacio, Palacios, and the parents are Martin and Bonnie. Amelia Ann Smith, and the parents are Nicholas and Emily Smith. Lydia Jane Smith, and the parents are Andrew and Callie Smith. Noah Matthew Snow, and the parents are Matt and Molly. Matt and Molly Snow. <laughs> if you look out there, it'll even be better. Now wave out there, wave out there. Snows, right? Ann Calloway Terry, and Bennett Daniel Terry, and the parents are Jordan and Nicole. Down on the end. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay, okay. And then Ellie, Caroline, Terry, and Jared, and Amber. Yeah. I'll, I'll go this way. All right, good deal. Okay. Yeah, dad, dad. All right. Let's thank the Lord for each of these. Praise the Lord. Donna? We really appreciate you coming all of you parents coming this morning and bringing your children. And I'll just tell you what this is and what it's not. First of all, what it's not, we're not, 
they're not technically becoming Christians today. What we're doing is we're praying for you and for them that you will raise them in a home where Jesus Christ is real, that he is alive, and you're reading your Bibles and you're praying and you know the Lord and you teach them the ways of Jesus Christ until they come to Christ and grow in grace. That's what we're praying for. And uh, how many of you believe that families nowadays need prayer? Amen. Boy, boy, we really do. So let's all stand up and we'll just praying that these children will come to faith in Christ at an early age and then grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord. And as the darkness out there gets darker, May the brightness of the Word of God and the ways of God become even brighter on the church. Amen? Amen. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to be reading. We're, all of this is Scripture, uh, and we're basing it on Scripture. And then I will read, and then fathers, you will read from the screen. And then the congregation will read together, and then I'll read, and then the mothers will read with Donna. Then the congregation will read, then I'll read, and then all the parents will read together, and then we'll all read from the congregation. Okay, let me pray first of all. Father, bless this time and bless these precious families. We lift them up to you, and I pray for these children that your good hand would be upon them. And bless this dedication time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers here, would you read with me, please? I recommit my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I will love my wife like Christ loved the church and died for it. I pledge to be the spiritual leader in my home. I will bring up my children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Now, everybody, let's read together, please, from Deuteronomy 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up proverbs 22 6 says train up a child in the way he should go and even when he's old he will not depart from it so mothers here if you will read with donna please i recommit my life to the lordship of jesus christ I will love and respect my husband and submit unto him in all things as unto the Lord. My family and my home will be my priority, second only to my personal walk with Christ. Now let's all read together from Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. And then we continue in Psalm 127. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full. There's some full quivers up here, amen? They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. Parents, read with Don and me, please. This, this child, child is a, a gift, gift from God, God to us. us. We, we will, will provide, provide an atmosphere in our home that will promote this child's salvation and Christian, Christian growth. growth. Now let's all read together from Colossians 3. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. And fathers, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. I want the family members of these uh, young couples and these children to feel free to come right up and to join them and lay hands on them, pray for them. And if you're a good friend of the family and you want to come too, and they're okay with that, uh, you just come right on. Give you just a moment to do that.
Church family, if you will, reach your hand out toward these families, toward these children. Pray for them as I pray. Our Father, we thank you for Wade Franklin, Wyatt Farmer, Catherine Rivers, Elijah Lynn, Mary Allen, Sykes Hamilton, Dean Bentley, Hannah Grace, Campbell David, Andy Morgan, Kay Rihanna Why the Arrow, Gavin Michael, Rhett Andrew, Ellie Jane, and Zeke Reinhardt. Raven Grace, Raven Grace. Amelia Ann. Lydia Jane. Noah Matthew. Ellie Caroline. Ann Calloway. And Bennett Daniel. Our Father, we lift them up to you. In the name of Jesus. And we pray that your hand would be upon each of these families. That they will love you with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. I pray for these men. I pray, dear God, that they will love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That they will love them like their own bodies and themselves. That they will live with them in an understanding way and grant them honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that their prayers will not be hindered. I pray for these mothers, these wives, that they will love their husbands and submit under their leadership and respect their husbands and that they will, these couples will pray and grow. Lord, I pray that there would never be divorce in these marriages. And Father, I pray that they will bring these children up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. I pray that all these children would increase in wisdom, stature, and in favor with you and with their fellow man. And at an early age, they will repent of their sins, believe in Jesus, and receive him as Lord and Savior. And then they will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And Lord, that they will marry godly people who have godly parents who will continue to raise their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Have your hand upon them. In all respects, may they prosper, be in good health, just as their souls prosper. Bless them and keep them. Make your face shine upon them. Be gracious unto them. And lift up your countenance upon them, Lord, and give them your shalom, your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for every one of these families. Amen. Good to have you all.
rejoice and celebrate. The Lord has been good, and He is good. So let's be glad. Sing together. I'll give thanks to you, Lord.
Amen. The Lord gives us joy when he comes to live inside us. Would you be seated and let's celebrate with some folks who are following the Lord in believers' baptism. Let them hear the joy of the Lord in you. Uh, good morning, church family. It's an exciting day. We have two that we're celebrating with. Both have repented of their sins. They believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and rose from the grave, and they've received him personally into their life. This is my six-year-old friend, Charlotte Nugent. Charlotte, it's a privilege of mine to baptize you today in front of all of these people as my new sister in Christ. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in his likeness unto death, raised to walk in a newness of life. This is my friend, London Wart. London, it's a privilege of mine to baptize you today in front of all of these witnesses as my new sister in Christ. And I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in his likeness unto death, raised to walk in the newness of life. All God's people said, amen. Why don't you stand? Sing along as Jeff and Hannah lead us. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul.
Sir. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the second chapter in the Bible, Genesis 2, and we'll be there in just a moment. I thank the Lord for the good music we've had today, and I, I really enjoy. Amen. Let's thank them. Thank them for leading us in that. I really appreciate all the work that they do, and it's good to see all of our choir and orchestra and our praise team, all of them together like they were today. God is the creator of our universe. Amen. The Lord created everything in the universe in six 24-hour days. Some people say, how in the world can you believe that? Because the Bible says there was evening and there was morning, day one, day two, day three, and so forth. So I don't believe that the Hebrew word yom is referring to a long period of time. I believe it's talking about a 24-hour day. I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants to, how fast he wants to. There's no limit to him. And on the sixth day of creation, God created Adam and Eve, one man, one woman. On that day, he created marriage. It's very interesting uh, I have walked three of th our three daughters uh, down the aisle. Do you know where that started? The Garden of e Eden. God the Father was the father of the first bride, and he walked her down the aisle, if you will, in the Garden of Eden and gave her to the first groom, and that was Adam. And that was the first wedding that was consummated. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we see God's plan for marriage, God's plan for family, one man, one woman. It's very interesting, within only six or seven generations, things started to change. And we think that today we live in a very sinful time. Well, it was a sinful time back then as well, because the seventh generation from Adam through his evil son Cain produced what is referred to as polygamy. A man named Lamech, seven generations from Adam through the lineage of Cain. The Bible says in Genesis 4.19, Lamech took to himself two wives. Immediately that distorted God's original plan. It's very interesting, my wife and I were talking about this. Did you know that my wife knows the Bible really well? <laughs> and we were talking about this, and she said, you know, the seventh generation from Cain was a sinful generation, but the seventh generation through Seth was Enoch. Does anybody remember Enoch? The Bible says Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He didn't die physically. He went to heaven. And that was the righteous lineage. And soon after Lamech distorted God's original plan for marriage by the sin of polygamy, there was a lot more deviation that took place. The Bible says in Genesis 6-5, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Again, we think that things are bad now, and they are, but listen to this. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. It's been bad a long time, folks. So much so that right after that verse, guess what God did? He called a man named Noah to build an ark to save his family 
to save mankind. Sometimes people talk about races. We all came from Noah and his three sons. If you're breathing, you came from a big boat. And you came from a man named Noah and from the lineage of his sons. The Bible says that it was just a little bit longer even after Noah and his sons were the only ones they replenished the earth, but it wasn't long at all that sexual sin was being committed again. We read in Genesis 19 about Sodom and Gomorrah completely populated with males who would engage in the sin of homosexuality. The men of that city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, Genesis 19, 4, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. Did you hear that? Both young and old. Homosexuality was young and old. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men? These were two angels, actually, who came to you tonight. Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. I won't go into what that means, but I think you know. It was the first biblical example of homosexuality. Paul describes homosexuality with these words in Romans 1. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire toward one another, and men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do these things which are not proper. Now, I'm talking to somebody in this room that has same-sex attractions. You struggle with that. And I want to encourage you to pray to read the Word of God, to go to counseling, to talk with people. But I do want you to see what the Bible says about it. It says that all of the LGBTQ activity is, and I'm just reading from Romans, degrading, unnatural, indecent, error, depraved, and not proper. And when God called me to preach, I told him, I'll preach the Bible. I won't preach the culture. I'll preach the Bible. And the culture has changed, but the Bible has not changed. We need to love everybody, even people that struggle with same-sex attraction. We need to love them. And you know, if you love somebody, you know what you do? You don't lie to them. You lovingly tell them the truth. And so anything you hear today from me, I want it to be the truth, but I want it to be in love, okay? No need, there's no need today for clapping and all of that. And I know that you understand what I'm saying there. In our day, the world has turned its back on the truth of God. And I believe Satan and demonic strongmen have attacked biblical marriage and the biblical family at every front. Our highest political offices affirm sinful deviations from biblical marriage and family. They're even so deceived that they affirm the killing of unborn babies. I came across a picture recently. That was Life Magazine April the 30th, 1965. 1965. This was a picture of an unborn baby 18 months from conception. 18 months from conception. Like I said, <laughs> my wife, I, I heard her voice. I said, baby, I'm, 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 it's 18 months. No, it's 18 weeks. 
And all the women said, amen. amen. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> That'd be twice as long, wouldn't it? That's right, yeah. Can we start over? <laughs> but look at that picture. Is that a baby? And yet, in America, keep, the, keep that on the screen, please. Put that back on the screen, yeah. Every day, 2,000 of babies like this are murdered by means of abortion. I pray that the Supreme Court will overrule Roe versus Wade. I do, I do. So how have things changed so radically? How did we get into such a mess? How did we deviate from heterosexual monogamous marriage to what we have today? Is there any hope? Yes, there is, because God is alive. God is alive. Don't ever picture God as wringing his hands, thinking about what am I gonna do? He is a sovereign God. He is in charge. He has a plan, and even the devil cannot mess up the plan of God. God is bringing everything to the coming of his son, Jesus Christ. But before that happens, on this Mother's Day, let's just go back and take a look at the beginning, okay? Marriage 101. Look at Genesis 1, verses 26 and following. You can just follow on the screen if you'd like to. If you have a Bible, feel free to join. Then God said, let us make man in our image. There's the Trinity, us, our, those are pronouns that are plural, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now go down to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, brought them to the man to see what he would call them or name them, and whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he, God, took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place, and then the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And these are the first wedding vows ever given. Then man, Adam, said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now here's our verse, verse 24. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined or cleaved to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and the wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Could we read Genesis 2, 24 together? Would you read that with me, please? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Let's talk about Biblical marriage. First of all, we see the pattern for marriage. For this reason, the Bible says there, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. It shows the eternal 
pattern God has for marriage. God's standard, if you will, for marriage. Heterosexual, monogamous marriage. Heterosexual, a man and a woman. Male and female. Monogamous, one man, one woman. That's the first biblical marriage, and we see it here in Genesis 2, 24. And it actually gives, in that one verse, two references to heterosexual monogamous marriage. If you look at the verse, it says that a man will leave his father and his mother. I don't want to be trite, but he didn't say father and father. He didn't say mother and mother. When a man left his home, he left two parents that had a heterosexual monogamous marriage. He did not leave a homosexual, parents who were homosexuals or lesbians. Then after he left his father and mother, he began a new heterosexual monogamous marriage. It says, for this reason, a man shall be joined to his wife. He wasn't joined to a man, and a woman wasn't joined to a woman. When a man married, he left heterosexual monogamous parents and joined his wife to form a separate heterosexual monogamous marriage. One man joining one woman is God's design for marriage. And guess who quoted that? Jesus. Jesus quoted when he was asked about divorce. He said, I'll tell you about biblical marriage, but we have to go back before the first sin was committed in Genesis 3. Let's go to Genesis 2, 24. He answered and said to them, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? He's talking about Genesis 1, 27. And in verse 5 in Matthew 19, he says, for this reason, he's quoting Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave or join to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but they're one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. You hear that at many weddings. Now, I have heard, mistakenly, that Jesus never addresses the issue of homosexuality, and I'm not here to beat up on anybody. Again, if you struggle with LGBTQ, I'm not here to beat you up, but I am here to tell you the truth. Some say that Jesus never addressed that. Oh, yes, he did. When he affirmed the biblical pattern of marriage, he said the only true pattern of marriage and the only place for true sexual participation is in a marriage where there's one man and one woman. That's what Jesus said. Jesus quoted the seminal text the basic text. And so did the Apostle Paul when he was talking about marriage. Guess where he went? Same place Jesus went. Back to Moses, back before the fall, back before sin entered the world. Ephesians 5, 31, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one. You say, well, Brother Steve, now times have changed and things are different. Times haven't changed. Things aren't different. They're no different than Genesis 6, 4, when the whole world was out of control morally and everything. There's no, there's no difference than Sodom and Gomorrah. No difference. I mean, we still are struggling with the same things that we've struggled with since the garden, since that first partaking of forbidden fruit. But God's standard does not change. That's what, that, that's what I want you to take away. God's standard doesn't waver with what the culture says. God's standard is God's standard. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the pattern for marriage is what started in the Garden of Eden. Heterosexual monogamous marriage, one man and one woman. That's the pattern for marriage. Now, look at the parting of marriage. Now, I'm not talking about divorce. I'm talking about something else. For this reason, a man shall leave 
his father and his mother. Everybody say the word leave. leave. What does that mean in the Hebrew? It means to leave. <laughs> well, what does that mean? It means to leave. To leave. <laughs> Adam and Eve's descendants were to create new families. They were to marry individuals of the opposite sex and leave their parents. This is where a lot of couples get in trouble, young couples. They don't leave their parents, and there's a lot of ways to leave them. You say, what do you mean by leaving their parents? I don't know if I like that or not. Well, number one, I didn't say it first. God did. I'll give you three ways I think that young couples ought to leave their parents. They ought to leave them physically. They ought to go start another house. Go to another place. The Bible says it's not good for the man to be alone. Every woman in here would know that. Because <laughs> we mess the house up when we're alone. That's right. But it's also not good for young married couples to live indefinitely and permanently in the same house with their parents or their in-laws. Now, if you're, you know, if you're building a house and you're, you know, waiting or if you, you know, you are just getting started, you know, and you want to live a month or so like that, that's fine. But, but to live with no end in sight, that's not healthy. It's not. You need to leave. And it's certainly fine to have your parents that are aging to come live with you. I'm not, I'm not talking about those kind of things. I'm talking about getting married and just going to live with one of your parents indefinitely. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You need to leave. If your parents are healthy, you need to leave. There's only one man that can be the man of one house. There's only one woman that can be the woman of one house. Married couples need to leave physically. They also need to leave financially. It's quiet in here, isn't it? <laughs> if a man and a woman are not able to support themselves financially, they're not ready to get married. Couples, don't depend financially on your parents. You don't have to have two cars when you first get married. That doesn't mean one of you has to walk. It does mean that you have to share. You don't have to buy a house to be married. You can rent. You don't have to have huge salaries to be married. You can do yourself a favor and I don't work for Dave Ramsey, but I, I am a real disciple of his work. Go get Dave Ramsey's materials and do what he says. And I told him in person, I said, you just stole my daddy's stuff. Because <laughs> my daddy tied to the church, developed a budget, he stuck to it, he saved for the future, he avoided debt, he lived within his means, and he was generous with other people. That's exactly what the Bible teaches, is it not? You know what Dave told me? He said, I interviewed 100 people like your daddy, and that's where I got my stuff. Don't depend on your parents financially. And parents don't constantly give money to your children. When you do that, look at me. You think you're helping. But I have seen this more than once. When you give something to your child and just keep pouring it on there, their spouse is going to resent it. You think you're helping, but you're harming that marriage. Oh, but they're struggling. Struggle's good. Let them struggle. Oh, but they, they only have bologna to eat. Praise God for bologna. Amen. <laughs> it's okay. They will live. Now, if there's once in a while you need to help them out, I understand that. But it's a quick way to anger your child's spouse. 
They need to leave financially. And then they need to leave emotionally. Now, this one's tough. Married couples need to transfer their primary loyalties away from their parents to their spouse so that what their spouse says and thinks is more important to what their parents say or think. And parents of married children, you should want that. You should want them to have a healthy marriage. When they got married, they created a new family unit. You can leave, by the way, you can leave your parents physically and financially, but not emotionally. When you're always sitting around pining for the good old days. Well, that'll bless your new spouse, won't it? Oh, I remember when I was at, in Egypt, we ate all these good foods, but now we're in the desert and all I've got is manna. I remember when at mom's house, we had a swimming pool. Man, we don't even have a bathtub. Zip it. And just go right on. You'll be fine. Wise parents never pressure their married children about anything. But what about, what about holidays? They need to be exactly with us the same time or maybe a little bit more with us than the same time with those other people. Let it go. <laughs> Let it go. Back off. If you don't, you're going to regret it. Let it go. They have a new family. And what you need to say is, come whenever you want. Leave whenever you have to. Now, when they have grandbabies, say, come whenever you want. Leave the grandbabies. But don't pressure them. Don't pressure them. Young couples, do not be manipulated by your parents or your in-laws. You have the right from God to start your own family. Manipulation usually shows up in two ways. Number one, anger. Somebody tries to manipulate you through anger, they try to come at you and fuss at you and make you melt. Don't give in to that stuff. That's just like a spoiled little child. Don't give in to that stuff. Parents do better than that. And then not only anger, but self-pity. Acting so, oh, we're just so, it's everybody else has their children and we don't. When your parents act that way, ignore them. <laughs> parents, don't interfere with your children's marriage. No, don't. Dr. Rogers said, the best advice I have for how to parent, how parents should relate to their married children and their spouses is knees bent, arms open, mouths closed. Donna had an aunt named Jenny. Jenny was to the point. And when our son got married, Grant, back in 05, Jenny came up to Donna and said, Donna, has anyone told you what is the role of the mother of the groom in a wedding? Donna said, no, Jenny, but I'm sure I'm about to be told <laughs> what the role is of the mother's, the mother of the groom at the wedding. She said, good, I'll tell you. Here's the role of the mother of the groom at the wedding. Wear beige and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> I like that. Leave your parents emotionally. You gotta leave or you will grieve. You gotta leave them physically, financially, and emotionally. You still love them, 
but you transfer your primary loyalties away from your parents and you start a new family. You transfer your primary loyalties to your spouse. And let me just say this and I'll move on. When you make a decision as a young couple, the husband, the man, needs to talk to his parents and tell, you, tell them what the decision is. And then the wife needs to tell her parents what the decision has been made. And you have to honor your parents, but you don't have to obey them anymore. You don't. I've just liberated you, all right? You don't. You honor them, but you don't have to obey them. Be kind, but you don't have to do everything they say. And if they get mad, that's not your fault. You say, would you go to the last point? Yes, I will. Okay. That's the parting of marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. And then look at the last part, verse Chapter 2 of 24, it says, the partnership of marriage. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined or cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. When you leave your parents, you join to your spouse. You cleave to one another. You create a brand new, a brand new marriage and a brand new home. We read in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. That word helper is etzer, etzer in the Hebrew. And the word helper is a little stronger than we think. It's a helper, but it's also a protector. And ladies, you become a warrior for your husband, a prayer warrior, an encourager, and a shield for him. I'm going to tell you something, guys. Look at me. If you don't know the will of God, go to the Word of God and then go to the wife that God gave you. Women hear from God. You hear what I just said? Women hear from God. You say, well, that's because you're married to Donna. No. <laughs> Women hear from God. And you be his warrior. You be his biggest fan. You be his, be his cheerleader, but you fight for him on your knees. Pray for your husband. You pray for him. That's how he'll change into a Christ-like man. I know. I know. I've got a wife that has prayed for me every day for the last 40, almost 42 years. She probably started, I'm sure she started before we got married. Pray for them. Fight for them. Stand up for them. In our book, Biblical Femininity, is that right? Christy Cole says, an etzer is someone who is for you, an ally, someone who supports, aids, rallies to your cause and brings you strength. And God entrusted his etzer nature to women so that they might fight and reflect his character in this distinct and powerful way. Then as the father of the bride, the Lord escorted Eve and gave her to Adam, Genesis 3, 21 and 22. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And Adam responded with the first wedding vows. This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And then Moses speaks regarding marriage 101 in Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father, shall cleave to his wife, father and mother shall be joined to his wife or cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And then Genesis 2, 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And here we see that they cleave for fellowship, but they also cleave for intimacy. And that sexual intimacy is for pleasure, but it's also for procreation. And that's why the devil has perverted biblical sexuality. That's why he is the author of abortion, Satan is. Because every abortion kills a baby who is made in the image of Almighty God. And you can't believe how much the devil hates God. He also attacks marriage because he hates the Christ 
of God who is like the groom and we are like the bride. So he hates marriage. He hates the family. And he's behind all the deviation that we have in our culture away from heterosexual monogamous marriage. You want to know the standard? It's real simple. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and he shall be joined. He shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the only place for wholesome sex is in a marriage that is heterosexual and monogamous. God gave it to you to enjoy and to procreate, to be part of his created order. In his excellent book, The Meaning of Marriage, Pastor Tim Keller shares a great statement about the mystery of marriage. He said, if God had the gospel of Jesus' salvation in mind when he established marriage, then marriage only works to the degree that it approximates the pattern of God's self-giving of love of Christ. Start here, Paul says, do for your spouse what God did for you in Jesus, and the rest will follow. This is the secret, that the gospel of Jesus and marriage explain one another. That when God invented marriage, he already had the saving work of Jesus in mind. Every marriage is a picture of Jesus and the church, and it is sacred It is sacred. That's why weddings ought to be sacred from beginning to end. It's a holy thing. And that's why marriages are to be sacred from the beginning to the end. Would you stand with me, please? And would you read Genesis 2, 24 with me, please? Would you read it? with me from the screen, please. Here we go. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Let me pray for you, please. Father, I pray for all the mothers in this room. I pray that you would bless them, and I pray that you will keep them, and that you will make your face shine upon them, and that you will be gracious unto them and lift up your countenance upon them and that you will give them your peace. And I pray that they will, if they're still married, that they would love their husbands as Christ. Lord, that they would love their husbands and submit to them and respect them and honor them. And I pray that their husbands would love them, Lord, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it and live with them in an understanding way and grant them honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. I pray for those, Lord, who are divorced. I pray, Lord God, that you would just continually draw them to you, that they will come to you. If there's no chance of reconciliation, if there's a chance of reconciliation, I pray that they'll be reconciled. If they can't do that, I pray that you'll help them every day to seek your will and to go forward, to forget what lies behind, to reach forward to what lies ahead and to press on. I pray for those who want to have children and can't. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray that somehow you would open a door of adoption or whatever it might be. Lord, please encourage them today, especially today. I pray for those who have lost children, Lord. I thank you that they're not lost. I thank you that if they're little bitty children that lived and died before the age of accountability, that they're with you right now. And I just pray that you would be with anyone who is grieving today. And Lord, there are people here, as we said earlier, that struggle with same-sex attraction, especially in today's culture that celebrates that. I pray that you would lovingly touch their hearts and show them that your standard of measure when it comes to marriage and relationships is one man and one woman. Show them that and let them learn to live 
in contentment and obedience within those biblical parameters. It's always good when we obey you, Lord. And I pray that they'll choose obedience, not rebellion. And Father, I pray that you'll bless every family in this room. Have your hand upon us, Lord. These are challenging days, and you know that. But we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and you're going to bring us through. I pray that you touch every marriage in here. And let there be peace and love. Let there be forgiveness, total forgiveness. Even if their spouse has been unfaithful, I pray that there would be forgiveness. I pray that there would be repentance. I pray that the good hand of God be upon them. Now today, if you don't know Christ with our heads bowed, I know I've not shared the whole gospel, but you can receive Christ by repenting and turning from your sins and by believing that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin and that he rose from the dead to give you eternal life. If you'll believe that and receive him, invite him to come into your life. If you'll call on his name, he will save you. And I would love to, read, to uh, lead you in a, a prayer to receive Christ right now. They're in the balcony on this main floor watching online or by television. Pray this with me right now. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. But I'm a sinner and you're the Savior. So I repent. I turn from my sin. Forgive me for my sin. And I turn to you. I believe that you died on the cross for me and paid my sin debt. I believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're alive. I receive you into my life. Save me right now, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for letting me preach on a very important text. Thank you for praying for me as I did that. It's not about me, but I just pray that the Word of God has come upon you and that you will listen to God's Word and not the culture. Okay? Today, if you don't know Jesus or if you just received Him or if you'd like to receive Him, we're about to sing our final wor uh, song of worship. Pastors, would you come and stand here? There'll be a pastor at the head of one of, every one of these aisles. If you'd like to come and receive Christ, they'll be glad to help you with that. If you've already done it, let them know that. Just come. Then if you'd like to go public with your Christian faith through the waters of baptism, we'll set up a time for that in the near future. Just come and say, I, I want to be baptized. I've been saved, and the Bible says I need to be baptized now. I've become a disciple, now I want to be baptized, and we'll set up a time to do that. And then if you'd like to join our church, we'd be honored to have you come and talk to them about that. If you need prayer, come and talk to them about that. We're here to help you in any way we can. I'm going to pray. All of you in the balcony, on this side, you'll go right over here where he's got his hand up. On this side, you'll go right over here where he's got his hand up, and all of you on this main floor, you'll come forward. Let me pray and then we'll worship and you please come as the Lord leads you. Father, thank you for the obvious sense of your presence in this room. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just bless and touch every person. And let them do the will of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing. I hear the Savior say. I hear the Savior say. Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find 
who have come today. I know it's Mother's Day, and I know that all of you fathers can't wait to go home and cook for your wife. I know that. <laughs> Just like you gave her breakfast in bed this morning. Uh, I, I didn't do that, all right. But, but uh, I do want to ask you, if you're a guest, we would be honored to meet you. My wife and I would love to meet you. And we'll be back in Guest Central. It's out these doors right out here. And uh, we'd love to just meet you a second, give you some materials before you head out. So if you got just a minute, I, I promise you we won't keep you long. Just come back there, and we just like to say hi and give you some materials on this Mother's Day, okay? Do we have a video? Or are we about to have a video? No video? You're the video. Okay, great. Watch this video of Drew, all right? Good. If you don't have time to go back and visit with Pastor and Donna, you can just text the word CONNECT to 901901, and we would love to get you some information and, uh, in doing that. Hey, I want to remind you this uh, Friday, 
our orchestra will be out at Overton Park at 7 o'clock doing a Pops concert at part of our Bellevue Loves Memphis. So you might take note of that and do that. You know, one of the things that we do, we do camp scholarships for families in need. Now, I, we do this, uh, we make an announcement. If that really interests you, uh, I just encourage you. you. We made it real easy. You can text the word CAMP to 901-901. We'll connect with you. Or you can go to our website to Bellevue.org slash give, and you can give to Camp Scholarship. It's a great blessing to families in need, and I just encourage you to do that. Uh, Thank you, church, for your continued gifts and support of the ministry. It allows us to do so many different things. Now, I want to introduce someone to you. I'm going to ask her to come up on stage with us. Uh, this is Jessica Pybron. Many of you might know her. But one of the things that we go against the culture with is a ministry. It's one of our Pathway partners called One by One Ministry. And uh, this is a way that, ladies, you can get involved and I wanted you to meet, uh, see her, but also she's going to be out in the lobby right out these double doors here, and she'd love to talk to you. But Jessica, tell them a little bit about One by One Ministries. Thank you so much, Pastor. And thank you so much, church, as you pay, pray for the different pathways. Um, my name is Jessica Pyburn. I am your coordinator, and I liaison with One by One Ministries. And it's a ministry in this area supported by local churches and by ours. But what we're doing is we are pairing up mothers who have chosen life with m mentors, mothers, um, to give them the opportunity to come alongside them, to do life with them, um, to educate them, to encourage them, to mentor them while they walk through their pregnancy and through that first year of life. We're doing that. We want to be able to help those families um, thrive. But most importantly, we're doing it because we want to build a relationship, a one-on-one -on -one relationship with them that gives us the opportunity to share Christ with them because we all know that the way to change the trajectory of any family is to share Christ with them and let him be the cornerstone um, and the foundation of that family. So that's what we do, Pastor. Well, Pastor, I'm Drew. <laughs> Drew. That's, appreciate it. <laughs> Call me Reverend. No, but anyway. Um, no, just kidding. Okay, it should have been a video. Okay, but you can go by. I want you to meet her. You can pick up a brochure, and uh, it's a delightful ministry. Would you close us in prayer? love to do that. And I will, everybody come back. Doesn't need to be just mentors. I would love to give an opportunity to show you how you can be a part, a prayer partner, how you can pray um, and be a part of this wonderful ministry. But let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just, I thank you so much that we can come together in your presence, dear Lord, that we can be with other believers, Lord, who love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we can be encouraged and that we can be reminded of the importance of marriage, the importance of the family, dear Lord, that we could celebrate life. And Lord, we celebrate life, Lord. And Lord, I just, um, you know the different stages of, and the different emotions that come through this day, dear Lord. You know those who are um, sad, those who are missing loved ones, those who are, um, have needs, dear Lord. And we all know that you're the one who can meet every one of those needs, dear Lord. So every emotion that is involved in Mother's Day, dear God, we thank you in advance for the fact that you are here with us, that you are um, faithful, Lord, that you see us right where we are, that you love us right where we are, and that you want to walk every step with us, dear Lord. And I thank you so much for that. I thank you that you're the source of all of our strength. And I pray today especially, dear Lord, that you would be with us as we go... Um, as we all go back to our homes, as we all go to those places where we're going to celebrate and honor our moms, dear Lord, I pray that we would do just that, dear Lord. We would honor them and we would celebrate the life that they've given us. Um, and I pray, dear God, that you would also, as we go into this week, that that would be a continuous um, thing in our lives. But I also pray that you would give us eyes, dear Lord, eyes to see and a heart to see those moms who are hurting, those moms who need you, dear Lord, and specifically moms that need help while they walk through this pregnancy. I thank you for the ministry, dear Lord, and I... Thank you for the opportunities that we get to mentor and educate children. And I pray specifically, dear Lord, that you might um, call more people to the mission, dear Lord, whether it be through prayerful um, prayers, Lord, or whether it be through mentoring. I pray that, dear God, that you would help us all to celebrate life by loving on those who've chosen it. Thank you so much, dear Lord, for a wonderful day being together in your presence. It's your name we pray. Amen.